Welcome to this evening's lecture, which is a reminder of recent, that means within my lifetime, uh, <laughs> significant and catastrophically motivated improvements in the practice of medicine. I'm glad that you've joined us this evening. I'm Bob Hauser, Executive Officer of the Society. The American Philosophical Society acknowledges with respect that it resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose historic relationships with this land continue to this day. We recognize their continued presence and perseverance despite centuries of land theft, removal, and persecution of their language and cultural traditions. Throughout its history, the society has benefited from its residents in this part of Lenape land now called Philadelphia. We honor the Lenape community and those of many other native peoples through our collections, fellowships, research awards, and engagement activities. For those joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded in 1743 with the, by Benjamin Franklin with the mission of promoting useful knowledge. Most of our nation's founders were members, and the APS had Thomas Jefferson as its president for 17 years, during most of which time he was either vice president or president of the United States. Like the Constitution, the presidency, the Congress, and the courts, as a source and keeper of knowledge, the society was an essential piece of the bedrock on which our new nation was founded almost 250 years ago. It remains so today. In the 21st century, we sustain Franklin mission in three principal ways. We honor and engage leading scholars, scientists, and professionals through elected membership and opportunities for interdisciplinary intellectual fellowship. We support research and discovery through grants and fellowships, lectures, publications, prizes, exhibitions, and public education. We serve scholars through a research library of manuscripts and other collections that are recognized internationally for their enduring historic value. Although we at the APS are proud of our 280 year history, I think it's especially important to recall recognize and reject less salutary parts of that story. While we at the Society continue to admire Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and other founding members for their key roles in the formation of our nation, for their leadership of the Society, and for their devotion to science, education, and other noble causes, we're also much aware of their faults, most significantly their slaveholding and racist beliefs. Also, during the 19th century, members of the APS were creators of so-called scientific racism. And in the first half of the 20th century, APS members were leaders in the eugenics movement. Today, we at the APS reject these immoral practices and unscientific doctrines. We're committed to sustaining the better parts of our founders' legacies while working towards a future of inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. That is the APS idea. In this evening's lecture, we'll hear from Dr. Hannah Wunsch about the polio epidemic of 70 years ago and about the positive and highly significant changes in medical practice to which it led. I don't know about you, but I'm old enough to recall the fear of polio that affected my cohort before vaccines became available. Now, I want to welcome this evening's speak speaker. Dr. Hannah Wunsch is an intensive care physician in the Department of Critical Care Medicine at Sunnybrook Hospital and professor in the Department of As Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine at the University of Toronto. She also holds a Canada Research Chair in critical care organization and outcomes. Her writings have been published in Nature, The Globe and Mail, and the Literary Review of Canada. 
The Adam Ghost, the Autumn Ghost, of which you will hear today, is her first book. And among many other distinctions, Hannah reports that she's a bibliophile, theater lover, tennis player, and an avid but terrible ice hockey player. (laughs) She lives in the Annex in Toronto, Ontario, and the village of Woods Hole on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, one of my favorite places in the world. So, with that, I will offer the podium to Dr. Wong. So, thank you so much. Uh, It is such an honor to be here. I just really want to thank the American Philosophical Society for giving me the opportunity to share this story with you. Um, Also want to thank my publisher, Greystone Books, uh, for taking me on as a first-time author, and also my uh, agent, George Lucas, who did the same. And I'm really pleased to be able to be here tonight. Um, I think, well, I'm a little biased, but I think this is an incredibly important story that has repercussions, um, that have, you know, ongoing repercussions, and that has really not been told. And as mentioned, the vaccine story when it comes to polio is very well known. And so this is a different, but I would say equally or more important story. I want to start out with a quote that I actually have in the introduction to my book. As an intern in 1952, we admitted patients with heart attacks wherever bed was available on the medical service, but always as far from the nurse's station as possible so they would not be disturbed by the commotion, especially the frequent telephone ringing. It was not uncommon for me when uh, arriving on the medical floor at 6 a.m. to draw blood to be sent for testing to discover that one of my heart attack patients had died quietly during the night. Older physicians accepted this as just the way it was. And so I think it's a really great description of where things were in the early 1950s. There are some of you in the room who will probably remember the care in hospitals in the 40s and 50s that was like this. And so just sort of as a summary, 70 years ago, around 1950, you could get oxygen through masks or tents. They had a few antibiotics available. They had insulin, x-rays. There were some vaccines out there against things like flu and diphtheria. There was no mechanical ventilation, and I'll get into that more, other than iron lungs. There were no ICUs, where I work now, and there was a lot of this one disease that I have never treated. I'm glad to say poliomyelitis. Um, Now, again, I recognize some of you in this room are very well aware of what polio is. Uh, It is an enterovirus, meaning it's an oral fecal transmission. And for most people, it's actually interesting because it's a lot like COVID-19. Most people have no symptoms. They get it. They excrete it, it's gone, they've been exposed, they're immune. For those who did get symptoms, the majority just had kind of childhood illness symptoms. Kind of, you know, fever, nausea, lethargy, came and went again without much ado. Um, But of course, for the small percentage, about 5% of people exposed, they ended up with some form of paralysis, either transient or permanent. And of course, images like this of the March of Dimes, which was the campaign in the United States to uh, fundraise against polio, there are a lot of children, in wheelchairs, on crutches, with braces, and anyone who grew up during that era usually tells me about how the fact they remember uh, uh, classmates returning to class in braces with crutches. It was a very common sight. Now, when it came to the paralysis that you could get from polio, the most common was that it would hit the spinal nerves, which would affect the limbs often, Sometimes, if you got very unlucky, it would affect the respiratory muscles. And this was the most common form, but a small percentage of patients got what was called bulbar polio, meaning it attacked the nerves that controlled things like swallowing and the ability to control secretions in the back of the throat. And this was far and away the most lethal form of polio, with about a 90% mortality. Now, I first learned about polio actually as a child because we had a family, a family friend by the name of Judy Monk who uh, had polio, and she would come to visit us in a wheelchair. And I remember kind of subconsciously, I think, thinking you know, how nice it was there was this disease that I didn't have to worry about, and that sort of put it out of my mind. Uh, of course, I think a lot of us were then further exposed to the idea of polio when we learned about FDR and the important uh, role he played in terms of the polio campaign, but also just the fact that he was a president in a wheelchair. And then for me later in life, the thing that sparked my interest in the disease again was reading Philip Roth's Nemesis. Uh, and I think that for many people, that was a, a real vivid reminder of what that era was like. Now, polio, until 1928, there was pretty much nothing they could offer. But in 1928, Philip Drinker, 
A professor at the Harvard School of Public Health, along with a colleague, Louis Agassi Shaw, came up with the concept of the iron lung. And this is in a kind of amazing photo. He walked by as his colleague was playing around with a cat in this box that was called a plethysmograph that allowed them to sort of measure the size of the lung volume. They would strap the cat in and then pull, suck air out and see how much air came out. Uh, they were also interested in whether or not cats breathe through the skin, apparently, and were testing the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the box. Anyway, he walked by and he was interested in resuscitation and realized that actually this could be applied to humans by sucking air out and you could actually make someone breathe sucking air in and out. He created that year, 1928, what was the, the first iron lung. This is the original, this kind of giant tube of metal, and it's attached to a vacuum device. And then, of course, the more common images uh, appeared later as they added things like portholes, and they were literally portholes. They went downtown to the docks and bought some portholes to put on there to give people a way to get their hands in and out. And if you're not sure whether this is sort of contemporary, here is St. Thomas's Hospital when I visited a few years ago, where they actually still keep five of these in working order, um, because occasionally someone with polio comes or who had polio comes in and, is, and prefers to be in an iron lung rather than more modern means of ventilation. Now, a quick primer. I realize many of you understand how iron lungs work, but in case you've never thought about it, it seals the body in at the neck and it creates um, what essentially negative pressure by sucking air out from around the lungs. So this is actually physiologic. This is the way we breathe. Our muscles uh, contract, and actually as they contract, they cause the, the rib cage to expand, and this is causes air to rush into the mouth, the nose, into the trachea. And then when we relax our muscles and the diaphragm pushes up, we just exhale without, um, without any effort. So that's exactly what the iron lung was doing, except rather than uh, allowing the muscles to do the work, it would suck them open by creating this negative pressure in that tube. Now, nurses hated it, of course, because in order to keep that negative pressure, you had to keep a seal. And so those portholes and things were a place for hands and things to go in to allow them to do nursing as best they could without actually needing to break that seal. So by the early 1950s, you have iron lungs for polio patients, and this was a huge deal. 1928 represents the first time you have a mechanical means of organ support, being able to keep someone alive when an organ has failed. And you also had a lot of other things going on in medicine. Up in the upper left there was a lot that was learned about resuscitation and shock in World War II. They were getting better at stabilizing people. In the lower left there was acute dialysis, the first dialysis machines coming into use. The upper right there is a, a man named Walter Dandy, who was a neurosurgeon at Johns Hopkins, who created in the 1920s the idea of having a unit where there was just expertise about caring for one type of patient, and in his case, his neurosurgical patients. And then the lower right there, looks like something out of Willy Wonka, is a very early ventilator uh, that was used in the occasional operating room where they would put someone to sleep and often paralyze them, and then need to hand ventilate them to keep keep them going while the surgery was happening, and they realized in some places that maybe it was useful to have a machine that could sort of do that pushing air in and out. But these were only in a very rare uh, operating room, a few in Sweden, a few in the United States, and really not anywhere else. What you definitely did not have was this idea that all of these things could be combined in any way. These were all very much siloed care that they had going on. So the story that I was interested in moves to Denmark, in particular Copenhagen, in 1952. And I first learned about this story reading this book called The Rise and Fall of Modern Medicine 20 years ago. Uh, it's a fascinating book. Each chapter is sort of an important moment in history, of medical history in the uh, 20th century. And there was one chapter on uh, this polio epidemic in Copenhagen. And I remember thinking, this is fascinating, and ultimately going into critical care, it was relevant to my field, and I kind of couldn't believe that there was nothing else out there in sort of the general literature for people, and so I decided to dig into it to learn more and hopefully write this book. And the story is set at the Blydam Hospital. It's actually pronounced Blydam in Danish. And this was the infectious disease hospital for the city, built in the 1870s. And it really was the infectious disease, disease hospital, not just for the city, but for the entire region surrounding Copenhagen. 
They'd seen a fair amount of polio over the 20th century, uh, but no major epidemics. And the head of the hospital, Henry Kai Alexander Lassen, the man here at his desk, was considered a world expert on polio, despite the fact they'd never seen a huge spike, but he'd seen a steady stream of cases over the years. And in fact, he had just hosted the year before, in 1951, an international polio conference in Copenhagen. Salk was there, Sabin was there, Enders was there, all of the big names in polio had traveled across the Atlantic and from around the world to be hosted by this man here. So at the Blight, and because they'd never really had a major epidemic, and because it was post-World War II when they you know, didn't have a lot of money, they had one iron lung, and they had six of what were called cuirass respirators, which is kind of a mini iron lung that straps on the chest and does the same thing of trying to suck the lungs open. You can imagine not super successfully. So it was really only useful in really mild cases of respiratory paralysis. This was all fine until the summer of 1952, when this started to happen an unbelievable increase in cases. They'd never seen anything like it. And by mid-August, more than 50 cases a day, 10 to 12 with respiratory failure, and the majority of those patients had bulbar polio. Now, 90% mortality with bulbar polio, and even with an iron lung, 90% mortality, because you can imagine if you can't swallow, and secretions are in the back of your throat, and this machine sucks the air into your lungs, it also sucks those secretions down into the lungs. And so, in fact, in some ways it made things worse because people would get pneumonias, it would block off their airways. And so iron lungs, were, they knew, were not the solution, but they didn't have a solution, and they were really stuck. Now, as part of my research, I was able to go to Copenhagen. This is the beautiful city archives in Copenhagen, and there's this amazing uh, little owl that welcomes you to the archives. And amongst many documents they had there, which I was able to sort through, uh, which was excruciating because I don't speak Danish, was this book. This is their black book from 1952. It is a book of deaths. They kept a record of every single death that occurred that year in the hospital, and each doctor caring for each patient would enter the name, the date, and the cause and sign their name. And flipping through it, you start to see beginning early July and into August just polio, polio, polio. And they had an 87% mortality, essentially the, the number that everybody knew for patients with bulbar polio. Now, Scandinavia is a little bit different from the US where it was the summer plague. In Scandinavian countries further north, it tended to peak in September and October. It was the autumn ghost. And so they knew mid-August that they were not even near the peak of this epidemic. And so they were pretty desperate and they didn't know what to do. Now, under Lassen in the hospital was a man named Dr. Mogens Bjornbo, and apologies to Danish speakers, because it doesn't sound like that in Danish, um, but uh, that's my American pronunciation. He was a junior trainee. He still hadn't finished his training, but he was quite experienced, and uh, he was trusted by Lassen. And Bjornbo, two and a half years earlier, had been on a ship the MS Jutlandia, and this is actually the ship's manifest. And on that ship, traveling back from the United States to Copenhagen after a visit for education, uh, here he is listed, and on the same trip was a woman named Doris Ibsen. Now, Doris Ibsen was returning because her husband had been training as a doctor at Mass General Hospital as an anesthesiologist, and she told Mogens Bjornbo about him. Fast forward two and a half years, and Mogens Bjornbo has a patient with tetanus, which is muscle spasm. And in fact, it was a baby with tetanus. And he didn't really know what an anesthesiologist could offer him, but he just thought, I think I need something to sedate this baby to try to get the break that spasm. And he remembered the name of this anesthesiologist. Now, there were only five anesthesiologists in the whole city, so maybe not that hard to remember, but he called on this man, Dr. Bjorn Ibsen, who's seen here studying. And Ibsen had this background where he had been told in 1949, interested in doing anesthesia, that he should go west to train. And he'd gone to Mass General, which is where his wife was returning from. And while he was there, he got trained in anesthesia, which was this new specialty in Denmark. Uh, there were really very few people did it. But he also learned a lot else, and he had some views about his time at Mass General Hospital. He wrote, at conferences, the young American doctors expressed themselves freely and without inhibitions. And I began to understand here that I was among doctors who thought differently and along other lines than those I was familiar with. He was exposed to a much less hierarchical system 
than in Denmark and the rest of Europe. And he kind of reveled in this, and he thought this was fantastic, that young doctors were listened to, and he kind of took this back with him to Denmark. But he was also kind of toiling in obscurity, because anesthesiology as a specialty was literally only recognized in Denmark in 1951. So until that point, he was sort of a, a, a no-name, he didn't even have a specialty that was real, and he was working case by case in the hospitals around the city. But Mogens Bjornbo calls him up, and he comes over to help out to care for this uh, baby with tetanus. And this is actually the chart that's still in the city archives. Um, and uh, I've blocked out the name because of privacy issues. Um, but it's listed as tetanus neonatorum. And they did a lot of things for this baby. They gave penicillin, they did a tracheostomy, they gave transfusion, they gave a little bit of paralytic curare, and they gave a lot of barbiturates to try to relax this baby. It worked for a few days. After four or five days, though, the baby died. Um, but Bjornbo had met Ibsen, and he could never quite articulate later why he thought Ibsen could now help in the polio epidemic, but he just had this inkling that this guy who seemed to think differently might be able to help, and he kept badgering Lassen, who finally gave in, and on August 25th, 1952, there was a meeting in Lassen's office that Ibsen was summoned to to come. This is not a picture of the actual meeting, but there were about 20 people there. We don't have any, Im any images from that meeting. And Ibsen came in, and Lassen said to him, what's your experience taking care of polio patients? Ibsen's response was, I've never cared for a polio patient in my life. Now, Lassen could have kicked him out at that point. It would have been pretty reasonable, but instead he said, I'm going to take you on a tour of the hospital, and I'm going to show you what these patients look like. And as Ibsen walked around, he saw these patients who were close to death, and they had high blood pressure, they had a fast heart rate, they had twitching, confusion, and clammy skin. And Lassen said, oh yes, this is polio. This is what end-stage polio looks like. The virus has overwhelmed the brain and the kidneys, and these are the symptoms you get. Now, Ibsen questioned that. And he had a reason to question that. He said, I don't think that's what's going on. I think these patients just aren't being ventilated well enough. We need to help them to breathe better. Now, just a very, very quick primer on this. So when you breathe in with your lungs, oxygen gets sucked in, gets carried through the red blood cells to the organs to oxygenate them. And then the exhaust from that is carbon dioxide that travels back through the bloodstream into the lungs. And when you exhale, you exhale carbon dioxide. So at the level of sort of the individual sac, the alveoli in the lung, you have this exchange of gases with the bloodstream. And this is what happens normally when you breathe in and out. And so if you stop breathing, people tend to think about the oxygen side, that your oxygen levels are going to go down. But it turns out that the buildup of carbon dioxide, if you're not able to exhale, is in fact one of the really sort of dangerous side effects of that. And Ibsen had been playing around in the operating room. This is another one of those coincidences. They tapped the right guy, this thing called the Brinkman Carbovisor. He, uh, this entire machine just measured exhaled carbon dioxide and oxygen levels. And he had just that year published a paper where he literally talked about kind of ventilating someone too fast so that they breathe down their carbon dioxide and then stopping ventilation and allowing their carbon dioxide levels to climb and not get it out of the body. And he saw the symptoms that these patients had when he stopped ventilating them in the operating room and they were the exact same symptoms the patients with polio had. So he had a proposal. He said, I'd like to do a tracheostomy on these patients. And Lassen said, well, actually, we've tried that to kind of protect from the secretions getting into the lungs. Doesn't work. He said, no, 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 I'm not just going to do a tracheostomy. I'm also going to do positive pressure ventilation. I'm going to blow air into the lungs to keep them ventilating. And this was really radical, because although it was used quite frequently in the operating room by anesthesiologists, it really was not used outside the operating room. And there was a lot of fear that prolonged versions of this might be detrimental detrimental to people. Now, I say it had never been used outside the operating room, but the third strange coincidence was that it had been an Ibsen knew it because he happened to be the consultant for the library at the University of Copenhagen on the medical campus. And he spent two hours a day hanging out there looking through articles and consulting on what they should buy. And he'd stumbled across this really obscure article in this journal that only existed for a few years called the Annals of Western Medicine and Surgery. And in that, he had actually written away for a reprint of this and had it with him when he went to meet with Lassen. 
And what it was was a, a story of the 1949 polio epidemic in Los Angeles. And uh, Albert Bauer and V. Ray Bennett, the authors here, had uh, been overwhelmed also. The, the hospital had been overwhelmed with polio. And they had iron lungs. So they were well equipped with iron lungs. But again, they were seeing a lot of bulbar polio, and they had a 90% mortality. And so they created this little device. They had people in the iron lung, they did a tracheostomy, and they hooked them up as well to a kind of positive pressure system. So they were getting the negative pressure sucking the lungs open. At the same time, they were getting the positive pressure pushed into their lungs. And they reported a decrease in mortality from 90% to 20%. So Ibsen knew this, and crucially, Ibsen recognized something incredibly important. You didn't need the iron lung. And that was not some, a leap that they made in this paper. That was Ibsen's leap, was that all he needed was that positive pressure ventilation. And so what he proposed was what he used in the operating room, which was this very simple device, a rubber bag, soda lime, which is a scavenger for that carbon dioxide, sucks it up when it gets exhaled, an oxygen tank, a humidifier, and then a tube that could either go in the mouth or with a tracheostomy th through the throat into the lungs. So Lassen was still somewhat unconvinced, apparently, but said, OK, I'm going to let you do this on one patient, and I'm going to choose the patient so you can show us what this looks like. So the very next day, August 26, 1952, a little girl by the name of Vivi Ebert was admitted. She was 12 years old. She's about nine here in this photo. And she lived in this house with her mother and grandparents. And she came in with classic bulbar polio. So they knew the natural history of this disease. They knew she was going to die. The next morning, Lassen rounds on her. She's an extremis. She's close to death. And he points to her and says, her. And so not a lot of informed consent going on. They just wheel her into a side room. Uh, and they call an ear, nose, and throat surgeon to do a tracheostomy. And Ibsen gets called in, about 20 people again in the room. And just, a, again, a very quick primer for those of you who are not familiar. A tracheostomy is a, a tube. That, it's a little incision in the neck. And they put a tube right into the trachea. And then you can blow air in and out through that. Um, one of the nice things about it is there's that little cuff on there, and that keeps all those secretions in the back of the throat from getting into the lungs as well. Now, Ibsen made one mistake. He was really worried she was close to death, and he was worried if he gave her general anesthesia, she might have a cardiac arrest and die. Um, it was a real concern. And so he asked the, e the ENT surgeon to do it under just local anesthesia, a little numbing medication in the throat, which you can do. Yeah, I see a lot of faces. But yeah, not very pleasant, but you can do it. However, not surprisingly, it's a little bit harder, and the ENT surgeon got into bleeding. So we did the tracheostomy, but now she had blood in her airway, and it was irritating her airway and causing it to spasm. And we have his medical record of minute-to-minute -minute care of this patient after he took over. And he wrote, now in a situation where we cannot perform ventilation because of her spasms and agitation. At this point, Everybody left the room. They literally went to lunch. And Lassen said to him, if you're still struggling when I return from lunch, please stop and we're going to let her die. So Ibsen made a decision that he felt the only way, and as a as background in anesthesia can say, the way you break this is you give anesthetic and put someone to sleep. So he risked it. He was worried he might kill her, but he says, now we administer pentothal 100 milligrams. He got lucky. She stabilized, he was able to ventilate her, and 15 minutes later, he writes, the patient is immediately warm and dry. Everybody comes back from lunch, and there's a word we kind of hate in the ICU, it's the, what we call the M word, miracle. But this was kind of a miracle, uh, you know, as far as they were concerned, because they knew the natural course of this disease. So she had the tracheostomy in, he was hand ventilating her, only one problem, Ventilators really didn't exist. I mentioned there were a few in a couple operating rooms around the world. And ironically, there was man, one man who was Danish. He was the very first anesthesiologist in Denmark by the name of Ernst Trier Morch. And in, during World War II, he had traveled to Sweden. He had literally gotten permission from the Nazis who had occupied Denmark to cross the border and go work with a Swedish anesthesiologist who did have a ventilator. He couldn't bring one back with him across the border, but he built one in Copenhagen. And he used it in the operating room there and became quite expert in it. Um, and this is a, a version of that ventilator that he created. But there was one problem. Trier Morch was in the United States, and he had taken with him all knowledge of ventilators in Denmark. Uh, he was the only one who had this knowledge. So there they were. They'd figured out how to stabilize a patient, and they didn't have ventilator, ventilators. And so they turned to the students of Copenhagen. 
The medical students were recruited initially second year students and then they realized they needed a lot more and they invited essentially all medical students and ultimately the dental students to sit at the bedside of these patients and hand ventilate them six to eight hour shifts, 24 hours a day. This is actually a photo in the archives of Vivi Ebert. Uh, and uh, this is her mother reading to her being ventilated. And what was uh, remarkable, of course, is they were awake. You know, once they were stabilized, these individuals had nothing wrong with their brains. They were awake. And so the students got to know their patients. They read to them. They told them stories. Some of them were adults. Not all of them were children. They became very close. Um, incredibly difficult work, right? They had no experience in doing this. They were often given literally a five-minute tutorial on how to do this, and then told, right, there's your patient, keep them alive, essentially. Um, they, their hands cramped, they worried about uh, falling asleep at night, they would throw wet sponges at each other across the room to try to stay awake, and they were given a 10-minute cigarette break every hour to decompress, and I love the fact that we have a shot of, uh, of these medical students smoking away. Um, in my travels to research this book, I did get to meet a couple of these student ventilators. This is uh, Anne Holton Jensen, who took me into her home, fed me lunch, and told me all about her experience. It was so formative, she became an anesthesiologist because of this experience, and uh, actually named one of her children after one of the patients that she cared for during the epidemic. Um, one thing that's lovely that I don't get to do in the book is actually share with you some film that is in the archives in Denmark, where you can actually see them uh, it, during the epidemic ventilating. And one thing to note is those bags don't self-inflate. So if you squeeze them and there's no gas flow to reinflate it, you can't ventilate. And so that was always a concern that something would get kinked and uh, that you might have problems actually being able to, to do that. And this is something we don't generally do now, is <laughs> let people drink when we ventilate them. Um, but uh, really remarkable footage to have. So within a few months, they, they recognized pretty quickly that this was a stopgap measure, but uh, at the peak of the epidemic, they were ventilating 70 patients this way. They went through 1,200 students over the course of this epidemic, but ultimately, to change to having what they call, literally called in the beginning mechanical students. And there was this explosion in development of modern ventilators from this uh, event. Uh, interestingly, not all the patients were happy about this. They really felt uh, kind of scared to not have that student with them. And so for all the sort of positives of being able to ensure that you're going to maintain the ventilation at a steady state, um, there were definitely some negatives of switching this out. Now, another key thing came out of the epidemic. There was this confusion about what was going on in the body when people couldn't breathe. Uh, and they had one measurement. Uh, they didn't have a lot of labs at that time. They had one measurement they could make, and it was about bicarbonate in the blood. And the bicarbonate levels were very high. And so they said, oh, the blood must be, have a very high pH. It must be really alkalotic as they die. Now, Ibsen came in and said, mm, no, I think if you could actually test the pH of the blood, it would be really acidic. Why? Going back to this image, when you blow off carbon dioxide, that keeps the blood at a steady pH of 7.4, but carbon dioxide is an acid. And so if you can't breathe and it builds up in your bloodstream, then your body becomes acidic. There was one man in the room who, he said it was like a light bulb went off. His name was Paul Astrup. He was the head of the laboratory. He said, we just didn't think about carbon dioxide. It just wasn't on their radar that the, res the respirations mattered in terms of what was going on in the bloodstream. And so he wanted to check this, but he didn't have a pH machine. They didn't exist, except he knew somebody who did. Radiometer AS down the street had been contracted by Carlsberg Brewery to make a pH monitor so they could measure the pH of their beer. And so he called up Radiometer AS and said, can I borrow your pH monitor? And they said, sure, and brought it over. And two days after the uh, first proof by Ibsen that this worked, he tested the blood of the patient. And sure enough, without ventilation, the pH of the blood was incredibly acidic. And he realized that you could help to monitor how well you were ventilating someone, too much or too little, by measuring that pH, how much carbon dioxide was in the blood. And so he developed 
developed a way to do this quickly, and by January 1953, he says, we'd done 705 determinations of pH in arterial and venous blood. He, he basically invented what we call um, arterial blood gas monitoring, and this is used in every ICU worldwide now. Um, in fact, it was originally called an ASTRIP because of him, and you know, I went online, you can buy a blood gas analyzer, which does all of this for you know, $15,000. They're in every ICU, and it really the first use of this uh, concept and recognition that it was important for kind of seeing into the body and understanding the state of the body comes from this. So by December 1952, the epidemic has peaked and waned. And just to note that this is a shift from what you would have seen in the United States, which would have been a sort of July-August peak. And the re results were remarkable. They went from an 87% mortality down midway through to about 36% mortality, and then down to 11% mortality. Um, really remarkable in a way that sort of, I, w I am unlikely to see in my career in medicine anything that has this type of effect. Um, just to show you kind of the aftermath uh, as they had put people onto these ventilators, this is again remarkable footage. This is, sorry, it's a little dark. Um, this is the entrance to the Blydam Hospital. And um, you can see they do something that we still struggle to do, which is to get patients who have been in the hospital for a long time out into the open. And they transported them attached to these these early ventilators, um, and uh, I love the fact they actually let them smoke <laughs> while they're on their ventilator, um, but uh, really remarkable, and I can tell you that, you know, I would say 99% of ICUs don't have the capacity, ability to give them such, people such a humane experience uh, when attached to machines like this. We struggle to, you know, even get them out of their room down into the hallway at all. Um, and so you can see, and, and you can also see the effects of polio on the arms um, of this little boy whose arms are in slings. I do love the fact they gave him little sheriff's badges to uh, help make it a little bit easier. So the following year, uh, Ibsen gets a job at the municipal hospital, the community hospital down the road. And he has learned a lot in the epidemic, and he has a vision. And in these room, this room here, in these windows, first he sets up a recovery room, a kind of daytime place for the care of patients post-operatively. But very quickly, by the end of 1953, he turns it into something else. He turns it into the first modern intensive care unit. Why do I say that? He chose a dedicated area to care for patients. He had 24-7 staffing. He had blood gas analysis, invasive mechanical ventilation, specialized nursing. That's all stuff he learned from the polio epidemic. He then took stuff he knew from the operating room, other organ support, and how to resuscitate people, the concept of very frequent vital signs and monitoring that we do in the ICU. And then this is the last piece. He recognized that this type of care wasn't, and ventilation wouldn't just work with polio patients, but would work with a whole range of patients who had all kinds of different forms of respiratory failure. So if you had a trauma, had brain injury and couldn't breathe, or if you had pneumonia or COPD, that you could be bridged with the support of a ventilator. By 1958, this hits the United States and Canada, and the first three ICUs open that year. Peter Saffer uh, is the one in Baltimore, Max Harry Weil on the West Coast in Los Angeles, and then Barry Fairley up in Toronto at Toronto General Hospital. And they actually reference what happened uh, in 1952 in Copenhagen. Um, Peter Saffer wrote, we knew what had been done at the Blydam, and this was crucial to our development of ICU in the United States. And so then you fast forward 70 years, and this is what it now looks like, but really Really fundamentally, although there's a lot more fancy devices, the care I and everyone in the intensive care delivers is pretty much the same as what uh, Ibsen was delivering in 1953. So what did we learn from polio? Ventilators, blood gases, respiratory physiology, ICUs, that actually all comes from that one epidemic. I do want to acknowledge that there's a lot else that came from polio more broadly, and that's a lot of the concepts that go into kind of basic rehabilitation medicine. FDR obviously was a really important in that and advocating for some multidisciplinary care. Um, disability rights, a lot of the early advocates for disability rights were polio survivors. The vaccine, of course, and then long-term sequelae of viruses, and I want to talk about uh, that in a moment, but I just want to say if you need an advertising for vaccination, this is it. The polio vaccine comes in in 1955. That's the Salk vaccine. And you can see the blue is the cases of polio in the United States. It just plummets and essentially goes to zero by about 1960. Um, I do want to mention that um, for a few of the patients 
uh, not only were they left with paralysis, but they were left with ventilator dependence. And in fact, Vivi Ebert was one of those. There were about 25 patients in the epidemic who uh, were never able to be weaned from ventilatory support and lived the rest of their life. Um, she was able to leave the hospital because they purpose-built uh, an apartment building in Copenhagen to provide support for individuals who needed continued 24-hour ventilation. And also just want to highlight, there was a, a woman who in her 20s was admitted by the name of Rosa Abramson in that same epidemic, uh, and she became a poet. And her poetry is absolutely beautiful. Um, in my book, I have a, a few snippets that have been translated um, that really give you some insight into what she experienced. Unfortunately, I was unable to get sort of the rights to, to publish uh, longer pieces. Um, but she, too, lived on a ventilator for the rest of her life. Now, the last piece which is relevant to today is this. So this is Robert Krauss, and he's the guy on the drums there and the blue jackets in 1948. Um, and a few years later, he got polio uh, in New Jersey. And he was in an iron lung for a number of months and, and had a pretty full recovery and went on to become a professor of psychology at Columbia University. Uh, he came to my attention because I like to read the New York Times wedding announcements, and there was an announcement for his son, and this was during COVID, and his son was getting married on an aircraft carrier that was moored in the Hudson River, and you think, okay, it was COVID time, so nice to be outside on some big space, but aircraft carrier is not what I would choose for a romantic event, but this one was moored uh, by 125th Street under the window of his parents and their apartment, which was Columbia Housing. And Bob Krauss was unable to attend in person, but was able to watch looking through the window. And he didn't go in person, not because of COVID, but because he developed post-polio syndrome. And post-polio syndrome was a worsening, often, of the original symptoms, and he was now attached to a ventilator again. This time, not an iron lung, but a modern positive pressure ventilator. And this is a, a syndrome that was first described in 1962 as someone recognized there seemed to be this relationship between people coming in with this kind of constellation of weakness, fatigue, pain, functional loss. And I think what kind of threw people off, it wasn't just a kind of worsening weakness of the individual limb or whatever it was that had been affected by polio. It was often more systemic symptoms like fatigue and pain. Um, and it, it, we don't really know how many people have had polio have post-polio syndrome. Estimates are all over the place. We do know that if your polio was more severe originally in terms of paralysis, that it's more likely that you're going to have bad symptoms and worse, uh, you're more likely to get post-polio syndrome. Um, there have been some reviews of this now. It's kind of recognized more in the literature. Um, and there are a lot of theories. There's a couple of theories. We don't actually understand fully why it happens. And just to, to explain, the um, polio attacks the motor neurons that control the muscles. And so when those motor neurons die, if you're lucky, some other motor neurons are able to sort of grow bigger and take over some of the function. And so that's how people regain function after a paralysis from polio. Um, but over time, uh, those, those nerves may wear out. And so one question is whether there's reactivation of polio. We don't know. Um, one is that there's some sort of autoimmune reaction, but the most common theory is this, that there's metabolic fatigue, that those giant neurons just get fatigued over time and you start to see sort of the sequelae of post-polio syndrome. So I think that this has repercussions and concerns for uh, the future. We know not only polio has these long-term consequences that only manifest 20, 30, 40, 50 years later. Uh, probably the most common one that we hear about is the fact that you can have chickenpox as a child and you do get reactivation or can as shingles later in life. We never really understand who's going to get that reactivation. There's also more recently uh, a lot of research into Epstein-Barr virus and its relationship with multiple sclerosis many years later, and pretty definitive data to suggest that the two are pretty linked. And so, to me, this is scary because I keep thinking about COVID and worrying that, well, I'm not talking about long COVID, which I kind of liken to the original paralysis that you're left with after polio. I'm talking about what we don't know is down the road 30 years from now that could manifest, um, and the only thing we have is sort of the knowledge that this sort of thing can happen and the vigilance. So this is the map 
uh, that's actually in the Medical Museum in Copenhagen. And uh, it was a map that Lassen had in his office, and you can actually see it in that photo, it's behind him. He sent out six medical students to keep track of all the cases that occurred over the course of the epidemic, and he put a pin in the map for each case, color-coded by month, and you can see this is the center of Copenhagen. It was an astronomically huge epidemic. To give you a sense, one in 200 boys aged one to four were paralyzed in the city of Copenhagen. And I just want to end by acknowledging that each of these pins is an individual. And I was lucky enough to meet many of these individuals who shared their stories with me. A lot of them are in the book. Um, and unfortunately, all of these individuals I spoke to have post-polio syndrome uh, in one form or another and uh, are struggling with that now. Um, but uh, they uh, are an incredible group uh, as a close-knit community in Denmark and the polio community, and I, I feel very grateful to have had the opportunity to speak with them. And really, you know, it's thanks to them that we have the interventions and treatments we have now when it comes to critical care. I'm going to stop there, a um, little plug for my book, which is for sale at the back. Um, but uh, I thank you so much for sitting through my talk and, and listening, and I'm happy to take questions, because I think we do have some time, and there's a microphone at the back. Hey, um, I was wondering more about, you know, you talked a little bit in like a sidebar, like other ramifications of polio. And one of the things you mentioned was that it had a hand in shaping the disability rights movement. I was curious if maybe you could talk a little bit more about that, because I know I've definitely seen, you know, think pieces talking about how with so many more people having long COVID, will there be more awareness of invisible disabilities and things like that? Yeah, I, I think my point really there was just that, you know, early on, it was a disease that caused physical disability, right? And, um, and in fact, there's actually some interesting data that suggests that people who are polio survivors, in fact, tended to end up more highly educated than people who hadn't had polio. Um, they think because, you know, they couldn't do physical activities and so, you know, kind of focused on kind of what we would call white collar jobs. Um, and so it, it just the reality was that it was one of the early diseases where there was a physical disability associated with it in a highly educated population where those individuals could advocate for uh, their rights. Um, I also had an interesting discussion about this in Denmark because um, when I started talking about disability rights, I spoke with a, a lawyer there who's very active in this. He said, you know, in, in, in Denmark, we have a slightly different concept of this. We don't think of it so much about individual rights. We think of it more about sort of the kind of right thing for the community to be doing for everybody in our society. And I was sort of struck that, you know, you get to the same place, but sort of slightly different framing of it. Um, so it, it, was, it was just a, a population of individuals who were well placed to be some of those early advocates. Uh, FDR also, you know, by having Warm Springs, which was this rehabilitation center, and bringing to the forefront that, they, it, it, that there were places that could be built that could accommodate those with disabilities. Um, people apparently look to Warm Springs where uh, you know, they would go for rehabilitation and point to it and say, look, you know, we can make places which are accessible to all. And uh, that was one of the reasons that there was a lot of lobbying for campuses to become accessible for those with disabilities. So um, it's definitely something that I only learned about sort of as I was delving into this, but I thought it was really interesting sort of said sort of side piece uh, or not side piece for some people, but for me, writing this book, um, about sort of the impact of polio in society. Polio, <clears throat> polio has been eradicated basically throughout the world. However, within the last 12 months or so, it's reappeared in Pakistan. Is that, is that so? And why would it choose Pakistan? So, Polio was never fully eradicated. They have been trying forever, <laughs> since 1955, to do it. Um, and there have always been a few countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan, 
most recently have been the two countries that over the past few years have had each a few what we call wild type polio cases, meaning they're not from the vaccine. Um, and so the challenge is, of course, is multifactorial in terms of getting those populations vaccinated. You know, war doesn't help um, and uh, just distrust of uh, vaccinators. My understanding was um, that the bin Laden um, team that went in was posing as polio vaccinators and that this has really set back um, the efforts because there's now a lot of distrust and, and there are polio vaccinators who have in the past 12 months died in you know trying to get into some of these places to vaccinate. So, so it's never been gone completely. The Rotary International is extremely active um, in terms of supporting the drive to eradicate polio. Um, the, you know, the last, there's never been since the 1970s wild type polio in the United States. The case that occurred in, in the fall or the summer this past year in the United States was vaccine derived. Um, so we have not seen a wild type case here, but for whatever reason, it's really hard to stamp out. Um, Pakistan just reported a case in February, um, but that's the only one that I know of this year. So I think that's created some hope that um, we may be getting closer than we thought. Yeah. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, just five blocks west of here is University, uh, Jefferson University Hospital, uh, where Hilary Koprowski, Polish and then American doctor, developed the first live uh, polio vaccine. Would you want to comment on the significance and influence of Hilary Koprowski? And second question, in, in the fight against polio and eradicating it. Second question, what you mentioned at the end is very interesting, very disturbing. Um, the people who've gone through COVID once, sometimes twice, sometimes three times, and the long haul COVID suffers. Um, is, I haven't heard any uh, of the experts talk about what might be down the road for those people 20 or 30, or even shorter than that, but say 20, 30 years down the road, uh, in terms of suffering and consequences, as you call them, sequelae, of the epidemic that we've just got, the pandemic we've just gone through. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. So Hilary Koprovsky is in my book. Um, and so I do talk about the vaccine development. And he was one of the, you know, the early ones to come up. Um, he, he, in fact, described, he tried it on himself, his first uh, polio vaccine. He described it as an oily glop. He ground up in a blender um, the, uh, I can't remember what, you know, part of the spinal cord of maybe it was monkeys, I've, I've, I'll have to go back and look, and then just drank it um, and survived, amazingly. Um, but um, yeah, he, you know, he, he actually created a lot of outrage because he tested his vaccine um, without a lot of oversight, without telling the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, which was the main body funding research. Um, and it's not clear whether some of the outrage was just, you know, they weren't in the know, um, or whether it was the fact that, you know, like many of them, he tested on those with uh, disabilities in environments where they were not well protected, as did a lot of them. You know, there was not a lot of oversight back then. Um, so he was very important because he sort of galvanized the others to realize that, okay, you know, it's time to really think about uh, testing in humans. Um, but at the, in, at the time that he did it, uh, they were not so happy with him. So that, that's about Kaprosky. He's a fascinating character. Um, and uh, there, you know, there are whole books that have been written about him. And in terms of, yes, this long-term sequelae, they, it hasn't been written about. Um, and I, I think that people are so concerned, rightly, about sort of the, the current consequences and long COVID that nobody's really stepped back to, you know, raise this concern. The other thing is there's nothing to be done about it right now. And so um, I have, a, it's not been published anywhere yet, but written an op-ed about this topic because I do think we need to at least be aware of it. And I think the awareness comes in surveillance. You know, we have great large data now. We have ability to look for sort of weird patterns of symptoms and constellations of things that they didn't have back in the 1960s when someone figured out post-polio syndrome syndrome existed. And so we are better positioned to identify a problem if and when it occurs. But uh, there is the concern of fear mongering, right, that we'll just get people completely paranoid about something we can't do anything about at the moment. Um, so trying to find that balance. So thank you for uh, sharing a great detective story with us. Um, I'm curious, you, you presented the graph for the United States as well. 
Um, was there other or complementary research going on uh, around the world that that uh, might have supported the Danish effort, or um, you know, taken taken things down a slightly different path to get to the same result, uh, or was you know Denmark sort of the bee's knees regards uh, research at this point? Yeah, so specifically research into mechanical ventilation yes, and such. Exactly yeah, so. well, you know, what's kind of interesting is that they weren't really uh, the bee's knees in, in mechanical... They didn't have any ventilators. And in fact, Sweden was way ahead of them in terms of research into mechanical ventilation. But Sweden was focused on the operating room because that was sort of the obvious place to be using it. Similarly, Trier Mort, who'd moved to the United States, was still experimenting and developing ventilators. There were, in England during World War II, there was the development of a ventilator that was used again in the operating room. So, you know, the reality is I would, you know, I wouldn't say they would never have figured this out. I think this just accelerated the, the move to recognizing that this was a way forward in a way that you know, might have taken them another 10, 20 years to kind of slowly trickle uh, through this. And, and to have an epidemic where you suddenly had hundreds of patients you could uh, publish on, they didn't get to do that very often. And so to be able to present data that was not just, you know, we did this to three people and they survived, but was actually compelling data on hundreds of patients was a kind of lucky moment in time, yeah or unlucky for the patients, but yes. <laughs> Hello, uh, first of all, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you. I turned 80 this year and I had polio when I was seven years old. And my mother had it at the same time. Uh, she was in her late 30s. And I, I, it's a grace of God, I'm, you know, I didn't get to have the affected deal, but I remember the old paddy wagons that came and took us to the hospital and we were in, uh, in Paramus, New Jersey. It was called Bergen Pines Hospital, it's not the same name now is all different, of course. And we were in a building that was out on the grounds, uh, separate, and um, I couldn't see my mother. She was down the hall, and she was in the hospital for nine months. She lost mm -hmm. use of her quadriceps a lot, and uh, and some of her throat. But it was bulbar, but they, it was a huge, uh, they did all kinds of studies on it because it was so unusual that it did not affect her breathing. She mm. did not have to go into an iron lung. But she uh, raised three children, came home, and what happened was in the hospital, in our own family, some things were going on, and the three of us, my sister, brother, and I were like one, two, three together. We were like the, the Kelly kids. And uh, they were going to separate us. I was going to Brooklyn with a grandma and all this, and my mother begged and begged the doctor, please, I have to go home and save my children. Excuse me. And he said yes, and he let her come home for the weekend, and she got a housekeeper, so we all stayed together. We're still, we're still alive, 80, 81, That's and remarkable. 82, and we're still close. Yeah. Be and <laughs> thank, thank you. But my, and my you. mother lived to be 85, wow. and she had these big braces, and at night she'd take them off and put them under the bed, and the two dogs would get on top of the bed. And she would go everywhere, and find, eventually she needed to have a wheelchair, and going from that independence, even though she walked with these big braces. And, and she also needed to have, just for balance, she needed to have like an arm where she was going someplace. So as a seven-year-old, I just got, get your arm out. And I still do it today when I see someone who's not walking. Well. Yeah. I put my arm out. But, but the strength of the people, like you yeah. spoke about, and my concern in saying all this is that people are not getting their kids vaccinated as much, and I just figure if they could just see those iron lungs, I mean, they were in the hallways. And then, of course, no one could come see us, like COVID. You had to be out, people were outside the windows, you know, downstairs, down outside. But I just hope that people would just see how serious this kind of thing is. Not just polio, but measles, all these things. Yeah. So that's why it's wonderful that you're telling the story. Yeah. And I appreciate it, thank well, you. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, um, you know, I do think to your point that it was unfortunately easier to help people see the benefits of vaccination when, you know, your classmate would come in the next day with braces on or crutches and, and or you experienced it in your own family, that it, there was a physical manifestation of the sequelae of polio that you don't get with a lot of other diseases that made it really visible what happened if you 
didn't vaccinate or you know didn't have access to vaccine, and that that's unfortunate. You know, for better or worse, COVID doesn't have that, and so it has become harder. And I think that you know I grew up in an era where we just didn't worry about infectious diseases. You know, as I said, I I knew someone growing up with polio, but it could kind of flick it away, right? And it wasn't something that would affect me. And so I think there's been a real lulling of people's understanding. And so I appreciate that. Yes, one of the reasons I'd love for the book to get out there is because it has the stories of what it was like to experience polio and the struggles for people to regain function, to get back to normal lives or to get back to normal but altered lives uh, in many forms and, uh, and the struggles they now have with post-polio syndrome, which are very frustrating because interestingly, they all describe how as kids get recovering from polio, they were told to you know, kind, of, kind of fight, 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 work harder, push harder, push, push, push. And then with post-polio, it's a lot more like, uh, like COVID, a long COVID where if you push a little too far, it seems to make things worse and how hard it is for them to shift that mentality and change their entire focus about sort of what will help them to be at their best physical function. Um, but um, yeah, and, and I think it's important also to recognize that it wasn't all children who were affected and there were many uh, parents who ended up admitted and, and had a lot of the struggles of you know, what was gonna happen to their children while they're covered and, and it was long recoveries. So thank you. Hi, good evening. Thanks so very much for that talk. It was really interesting. I just wondered whether in looking at the story, you ever looked at the South. Um, in the Caribbean, for instance, there were a lot of polio cases, certainly in Jamaica in 1954, there was a huge epidemic and you know other cases later on. Um, I think I'm sure that was the case more broadly in other parts of the, of the South. So I just wondered yeah. whether that ever folded into your story. I yeah, think. so there, there was a World Health Organization in 1955 published this massive book about polio across the world with data from all different countries. It is really sort of a fascinating read. And what was interesting about places further south um, was that you didn't actually get these big peaks in the summer or even the fall. It tended to be more sort of steady state. Uh, and uh, you could still get some epidemics, but they, it was a, a different pattern. Um, and again, nobody really fully understood this relationship with temperature and, uh, and geography. Um, but uh, in terms of the, the, the epidemic that I was focused on that happened to be in Copenhagen, I didn't write specifically about a lot of the other countries where everybody was battling polio, right? There was nobody who was untouched. Although they did note there were some communities where people seemed to have uh, a lower risk rate of paralytic polio, and the thought was that they had maybe more exposure when they were babies. Um, it, polio has a very sort of strange epidemiology in that they think cases started to increase because of better sanitation and less exposure when being breastfed when you were protected by uh, immunoglobulins from mother's milk. And so that in locations where this was maybe still more the norm, you don't see these big spikes as you did. So um, it is a fascinating epidemiology when you look at the worldwide. Uh, cases. I'm afraid we're going to have to end okay. there for this evening. So thank you so much. It was a fabulous well, Thank you talk. very much. I really appreciate it.